أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه من سنن بشرط من الدين أما بعد رب الشعر لصدي وصلي أمري وحلو أقضى من لساني يفقه قولي إن شاء الله we continued an explanation of hadith number four that we started off last uh, Wednesday as you know it was a long hadith uh, that talks about the creation of human uh, fetus and then four things that the angel um, at the time of breathing of Ruh decides, which is their risk, their um, death, and then their action, and then also whether they're going to be happy or sad. Uh, and then the last part of the hadith also some mentions about uh, Qadr, Taqdeer that uh, a person may live all their life as a good righteous pious person and just an arm's length between them and their death you know the qadr um, overtakes or parts them and then they do the actions of the people of hellfire and then they enter the hellfire and vice versa there are people who all their life do the work or actions of the people of hellfire until there's an arm's length between um them and their death and then their father overtakes them and then they do the people of the work of the people of jannah and they enter jannah so we had explained briefly overall the summary of the hadith today we'll go in into some more detail first thing that is informed here is about the takhliq of the insan the creation of insan insan has been created um, with two components we have the body the jasad huh? Oh, okay. Yes, I put it this way. Is it better now? No, it's better. So, um, there are two components of our creation. One is the body, al jasad, we say that. And then the second is ruh, the soul, the spirit, the soul that is in there. So, when somebody dies, it is their soul that exits the body. Hmm? Because you can see the body, that body. We can see many times dead body is lying there, nothing is happening. You lift up the dead body's hand, it falls down because there is no life. Ruh is a life. Al insan murakkabun. Insan is made up of two things, which is uh, the soul, the ruh, and then the body. What controls the body is the ruh. So the ruh can be good and could be bad, and therefore use the body accordingly. Now, in terms of the uh, insan's ruh or body, you can say there is another uh, component that is there, which is the aql or brain, intellect that Allah has given us. This is what differentiates us from other creations of Allah SWT. We are able to think, we're able to uh, construct our ideas, and we're able to formulate our words and thoughts. And that's why the Arabs defined insan as hayawan or not. It's an animal that can speak and comprehend and think and produce. Uh, that's why Allah says, Ar-Rahman allama al-Qur'an, khalaq al-insan allamahu al-bayan. This ability to speak, the ability to formulate our thoughts and then make those thoughts into words and pronounce those words, this is what differentiates us from other uh, creations of Allah, specifically from other animals. And you know how in biology they teach us that we are, human beings are like mammals. Whale is a mammal, there are other mammals out there. And that's how our intellect, our um, our aql, the aql that Allah has given us, is what makes us mukallaf, taklif. Mukallaf or taklif means responsibility. And there's an age for that. A person is only mukallaf when they reach uh, bulugh, balikh, puberty. So before that, the person is innocent, masum. So children are not mukallaf. Children are not required to do the ahkam of Quran and do the ibadat and worship. Except for salah. Salah is an exception because Rasulullah said that alimu awladukum salah, teach them the salah from age seven, then you know, get them to do it by 12. After 12, then even if you have to use force, use force because salah is something that cannot be compromised. But 
Mukallaf means the rules and regulations of Sharia are not applicable on a person that has not reached bulu, baalikh. So when they have reached puberty, the biological changes in their body happens. Now they are from a boy, they have become a man. From a girl, they have become a woman. So now it is responsible upon them. This is very important to understand because children are masoom, innocent. So they are not required by Allah to follow the commandments of Quran. Therefore, if, if children die in this dunya, before they reach puberty, they go straight where? Jannah. Jan. Because they are ghair mukallaf. They're not mukallaf. So they didn't do any sin. That's why children are masoom, innocent. They don't do guna or ithm or sin. And they don't have that ability in aql, in intellect, to commit a sin. Because they are ghair baligh. And that's why we say that somebody is na baligh, because they don't have the fahm, the aql. It hasn't been formulated yet. And look at the rahmah of Allah, mercy of Allah, that he does not hold that person responsible. And that is why they are free from responsibility. But yes, once they reach baligh, they have reached that level of puberty, now they are responsible. Even if they look like a child, but they are bilingual, like 13-year-old, most boys, you know, by 13, 14, girls mostly by 12, 13, and all that. So yes, a, a teenager, 13-year-old may look young, but they are mukallaf. Now every action counts. Now there is a sawab and, and jaza and, and also a penalty for anything they do. Second very important thing uh, in terms of the rule is that our ruh, you know, the hadith says that after 120 days, the ruh is breathed into the fetus that is in the mother. So before that, the question that the ulama asks is, where is the ruh? Where were we before we came in this dunya? And that is known as alam al-arwah, the world of souls. Nobody knows where it is. It is somewhere. But... The Quran mentions Alam Arwah in Surah A'raf, Surah 7, verse 132. Allah says, أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمِ إِنْ ذُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَتُهُمْ وَأَشْهَدُهُمْ عَلَى أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا أَنْ تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَمَةِ إِنَّ كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ Allah SWT is saying, and mention to when your Lord took from the children of Adam from their loins, meaning from their progeny, their descendants, and made them testify of themselves. You know, Allah took an oath in Alam Arwah from all the ruh. Every human being that's going to be born in this world, in that world of Alam Arwah, Allah took an oath from them. Alastu bi Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Am I not your God, your Ilah? Qalu bala unanimously together all the all the souls now this is all the souls we're not talking about muslim we're talking about all the souls all the ruh it could be kafir ruh or muslim or munafiq because that is decided after they come here in the dunya over there everybody is on fitrah fitrah is to recognize allah SWT. this is very important for da'wah also when a non-muslim comes to you and says i don't recognize god and we, you can tell them, you have forgotten about God. Because your soul took an oath, an oath, an, a pact, agreement with God in that. But remember, our brain has no memory of that. Our brain has no recollection. We don't know how we were in alam e The ruh was there. See, the ruh enters the body when it's in the fetus is only 120 days old. And the ruh exits the body on the day of your death. Whenever is the day of death written for us, the ruh goes out of the body. So if we have 40 years of life, the ruh leaves at 40 years. So from, from 120 days of the fetus to 40 years, this is the life of the ruh. And the body is formulated in that. So the ruh already took an oath with Allah. And Allah said, Alastu bi rabbikum, Am I not your Lord? Am I not your Lord, your, your God? They said all together, unanimous, qalu. It is the seal of jama'. They didn't say qala, qalu. Bala, shahidna. Yes, Ya Allah, you are our God and we witness that. So what the ulama say in terms of this hadith, now if the ruh already took an oath and when the ruh comes in the fetus, now every fetus that is born in the world, their parents or their mothers are different. 
All right. There could be a Jewish mother, a Hindu mother, Christian mother, Buddhist mother, Jain mother, you know, Sikh mother, Muslim mother, atheist mother. The fetus is getting groomed. And when the fetus becomes a child, comes in the dunya when it's born, the mother, whatever her religion is, she teaches that. If she's atheist, she says, baby, no God. There's no God. If she is Sikh, she says, Sikh. Huh? Guru Granth Sahib. If she's Hindu, she says, there are so many gods. You know, Ram, Gita, Lakshmi. So whatever the mother is, is teaching the child. Is this point clear? So Ru, the Qusur of Ru is not there. The, the thumb of Ru is not there. Ru came in a body that was born in a household where the father and mother were not Muslim. But the Ru is Muslim. Because Allah says here, وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ Allah is saying, I, I ask each one of you, do you witness me, Allah is God, Ilah? Huh? Am I not your Lord? Yes, Ya yeah, Allah, you are our Lord. That is why when somebody converts to Islam, we say they revert. What does revert mean? You were always a Muslim. Every ruh, every Bani Adam, all children of Adam are by default Muslim because they took an oath in Alam Yarwa. And that is the hadith. There's another hadith of Rasulullah that says, Every newborn child is born on a fitra. What is this fitra? This fitra is where the angel, the ruh, comes and breathes the ruh in the mother's womb after that 120 days. That's the fitra. Because remember, in Alam Arwah, the, the ruh took an oath. Now the ruh came in the fetus, now it's in the fetus. And now there is harakah, the fetus is moving. So the mother. She feels movement. And the doctor also checks the movement for throughout the nine months, checking heartbeat, checking movement, so, so that the fetus doesn't die inside. So this movement of the ruh, harak of the ruh, is in terms of Muslim. And when the child comes out in the dunya, it doesn't know anything about Islam. So Rasulullah says in that hadith, Kullu mauludin yulidu ala fitra. Every newborn child is born on the fitra, which is that the oath that they took in the world of Ruh, in Ali Marwa, they took the Ruh, the oath that, yes, Allah is my Lord, which means the natural instinct to remember Allah is one. This is the fitra of the Ruh. So, Kullu mauludin yuludu ala fitra. Now, the next part of the hadith is interesting. Rasulullah says, فَأَبَوَاهُ يُحَوِّدَانُهُ أَوْ يُنَسِّرَانُهُ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانُهُ He said, after the child is born, the parents make the child, remember the ruh, which is in the body now, the parents make the child Jew, Christian, fire worship, majus, you might just say. Here, it does not mean directly parents. It also implies environment, sohba. You have many Muslim parents. The child is born to a Muslim parent, doesn't know kalima shahad, doesn't know la ilaha illah. What is your name? Ahmed. What is your name? Salma. What is your name? Zainab. What is your name? Fatima. Do you know La ilaha illallah? No. Nobody teach you? No. Your parents Muslim? Yeah. Their name is Ambar, Muhammad. But Muslim by name. So the environment changes the rule from the original point. Original point is La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Of course, in Alim Arwah, Allah did not ask them Muhammad Rasulullah. Because all the Arwah, all the ruh were there together. And each ruh will come at a different prophet's time. Some will come at Adam's time. Some will come at Nuh's time. Some will come at Ibrahim's time. Some will come at Musa, Isa. So therefore, they will all, they were all asked one thing. Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? Qalu bala shahidna. Yes, ya Allah, you are our Lord. To recognize there is one God and only one God, supreme God in this world, is the natural instinct, the fitrah of every soul. That is why you see when people, when their fitra, natural fitra is awakened, they start searching for truth and people convert. Every kind of people convert. Hindu convert, Buddhist convert, atheist convert, Jew convert, Christian convert, anyone from any religion, they convert. Because that fitra is there. In other words, 
you have it in your ingredient, la ilaha illallah. It is just suppressed. You know, somebody just suppressed it. Huh? And that's why it is, like, how we say it? Suppressed it, like, it is compressed. But the moment the ruh gets any information about la ilaha illallah, it makes that connection. Alam arwah. Like Surah Araf that Allah said in verse 172. Uh, am I not your Lord? Now the Ru, so somebody convert when they're teenagers, somebody they convert when they're in their 20s or 40s or 50s. Whenever they convert, it is the Ru making that connection with that commitment, promise, hmm? which is very important to understand. So this is known as fitrah. That is why everyone is a potential Muslim. Every human being, is a potential Muslim. Rasulullah sallam, the way he dealt with people in Mecca and Medina, he looked at every soul, not with hiqara. Hiqara means degradation or deterioration. He didn't look as an insulting way. That, oh, this kafir, oh, this kafir. No. He looked at every human being in Mecca and Medina, potential Muslim. How can I save him? How can I save her? How? Meaning he had this compassion, rahma. He had this love, affection for people. In another hadith, he mentioned, Rasulullah mentioned that I am like that person who's standing in front of a fire and all the hasharat and all the insects are flying and flowing into the fire and getting burnt. So I am like that person who's stopping this. You know how you're standing in front of a fire and you try and go, whoosh, whoosh, go, go, don't get burnt in the fire. So he said, my example as a Nabi is like that, that I'm stopping each and every one of you, Bani Adam, children of Adam, save, save yourself, save yourself. Don't fall into the fire. Meaning he's saying human being by tendency, natural tendency, they get sucked into the fire. How? How do we get sucked into the Jahannam? Who can give me that answer? Simple. Huh? Yeah, with the, with, the, with, the, with the sins. But why do we commit the sin? Huh? Shirk? No, shirk is a sin also. But why do we commit the sin in the first place? What is it that brings us close to the sin? Huh? Yeah, but what about the nafs? Remember, it's the ruh and nafs are the same, by the way. Some people have this confusion. Is ruh separate, nafs separate? No, nafs and ruh means the same. So the nafs get sucked into the fire through sins, the ruh, but why do we commit the ruh in the first place? Yes, you are right. The connection gets weak. But what is the what is the what is the agent that attracts us to commit the sin? Shaitan. No, Shaitan is very sharif. Mashallah. Shaitan, he please, he's very, very sharif. He has nothing to do. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll go there today. I have an ayah. I'll tell you the ayah. Allah says in the Quran about Shaitan that Shaitan will tell us on the day of judgment, I am very sharif, I'm Pakiza. You did all the things. I didn't do anything. But somebody said something here? Huh? Yeah, what is in the environment? I mean, there is no not environment. It's something in our in our ruh that is embedded. See, ruh is not 100% pure. There is something in the ruh that brings us to do the sins and then we get sucked into the jahannam. Yes. What do we call pleasure in Arabic or Urdu? Oh, you did? I'm, uh, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I was looking for the Arabic word. Uh, actually, the word is not even pleasure, it's lust, yeah. desire, desire. The desires of the ruh, the nafs, shahwat, shahwa. Huh? The shahwa is there. If if we did not have the shahwa, no man would ever marry a woman. Simple as that. Why do you marry somebody? Because you have the shahwa. If you remove shahwa from your soul, you will remain a bachelor all your life. Because you have kabu, control on the nafs. It's the nafs that doesn't control the shahawad. So when you look at the opposite gender, the shahawad get, you know, activated. But if you have no shahwa, anybody can pass in front of you. You don't even look. That's why when you are above 70 or 80, you don't have that. I mean, there is still potential, but you have very less shahwa compared to when you're 20. Imagine an 80-year-old person and a 20-year-old person. 20-year-old person is like jumping up and down with shahwa. An 80-year-old is like, okay, no problem. That's why if an 80-year-old man does zina, there is a punishment for them to be stoned to death. Because you are doing such an old age. 
this is time for you to think Allah, 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 and worry about the grave. Your time is not to do fitna and fasad in society. Your time is to worry about your grave. You can die any moment. Well, not to say that somebody who's 20 cannot die a moment, but when you're 80 or 90, you're very close. Actually, you're living on bonus. Because there's another hadith of Rasulullah, I just remember. There's another hadith of Rasulullah, he said, أَعْمَارُ أُمَّتِي لَا تَجَاوُزْ عَنِ السِّتِّينَ إِلَّا سَبِعِينَ أَوْ ثَمَنِينَ Translation, Rasulullah said, the majority, the average age of my ummah will not go tajawuz more than 60. So if you're above 60, thank Allah a million times, you are on bonus. Allah has given you a bonus. Because Rasulullah is saying, majority, average of my ummah will finish in this dunya by 60. Very few will live till 70. And even more fewer will live till 80. And even more fewer will live till 90. And how many hundred year old do you see roaming around in our life? Do you ever get to see somebody in a walima, aqiqa? Salam alaikum wa salam. How old are you? 102. They won't, even, they won't be able to even say 102. Because they're so fragile, so frail, probably on a wheelchair, 102. By 102, you're like this. So if you're 80, you should be thanking Allah. Thank you, Allah, for every single breath. Because I could have been dead by now, according to the hadith. Also. But Allah, he tests some people by giving them barakah in age. Some people, Allah takes them away before 60 or by 60. And some people, he gives them test in the hand by giving them bonus, old age. There's an ayah in the Quran, Allah says that he gives that old age is a test from Allah. What do you do in this old age? If you're going around and creating fitna in society, making this person fight and that person fight, backbiting about people, lying about people, slandering people, bohtan on people, that oh, he's this, oh, he's that, or she's that. That is not your job. You're 80, 90 year old. You should be doing Allah, 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 subhanAllah. You should be worrying about meeting Allah. Any moment, anything can happen. Maybe cardiac arrest, maybe kidney failure, maybe brain failure. Something can happen because... As you age, you know very well that your organs start deteriorating. And you can already feel that after 40. Because Allah said in the Quran that by age 40, that is the hill. You turn the hill from 41. You start going down the hill. Until 40, you're going like this. The car is going up. At age 40, this is the peak. This is in Surah Aqaf, Allah SWT says this is the ayah in the Quran Allah is saying and when his when his or her full strength have reached at and he or she has reached 40 then he or she says at age 40 oh my lord give me the tawfiq give me the encouragement intuition to thank you for what you have blessed upon my parents my father and mother, and what you have blessed upon me, and, and give me the encouragement, Ya Allah, that I do good deeds now from age 40 until whenever I die. So if the uh, if the hadith says that average age of the ummah of Muhammad is 60, and age 40 you reach your peak, that's just 20 years of life. And then if you go above 60, you are bonus. So every day above 60 is a bonus. Every day above 60 is like thanking Allah, repenting to Allah. Any moment the call can come. Of course, call can come even before age 40. But now we know from the hadith and the Quran that above 60, you're living on bonus. So there is more higher probability of leaving the dunya compared to a 10-year-old, a 20-year-old, 30-year-old. And that is why Rasulullah used to advise the old people, احذروا أنفسكم be careful, be careful. A small slip or fall at age 70, 80, 90 will cost you dearly. It can cost you your life. Remember, this is what the hadith is saying. That a person lives all their life as a muttaqi, pious person. Very righteous. Namazi, praise God, everything. Salah, sayam, zakat, hajj. All their life. Not in your wildest dream you'll think that this person is jahannami person. In fact, that's what the hadith says, that this person does the amal of Ahlul Jannah, the people of Jannah, until the Qadr, Taqdeer, overtakes them. And then, how much? Dira, an arm's length, which means very short distance. For example, if a person is going to die at age 80, I said this last Wednesday, 
in the Hadith class. If a person is going to die at age 80, at age 79.5, 79 and 6 months, boom, the fuse goes off. And the person flips 180 degrees. And they do now, the next six months, they do the amal of the people of Nar, Jahannam. Everything they're doing is wrong, bad, hanky-panky, this. Which earns them that when they die, they become the people of fire. Remember, 79 years and six months, work of all Ahlul Jannah. All of that is wiped away one sec. So I, that is why the ulama say that this hadith is very, very important hadith to warn us that be careful in old age or be careful as you're getting closer and closer to your death because something can go wrong, something can go berserk, a switch can be turned off or a fuse can be fused off and then you end up doing the work of the people of hellfire. And likewise, the hadith says that there's a person who all their life, 79 years, 6 months, they do the work of people of Nar, Jahannam. They're like Jahannami person doing everything wrong, everything haram, everything. Suddenly, just before 6 months before their death, they flip, they change 180 degrees for the better. And now those 6 months that they lived, the last moments of their life on earth, they did the people of the Amal of Jah Jannah, and then they die as a Jannati person. This is a very, very scary hadith. But it's not there to scare us. And many of the ulama say that the part of the hadith that people confuse is where uh, yasbiqu, fa yasbiqu alayhi al-kitab. Yasbiqu literally translated means overtakes, overpowers. But it does not, it is not to be taken as negative. That, oh, it's a, like, you know, in English we say cause and effect. So it's not that the Taqdeer or Qadr caused me to die as a Jahannami person. All my life I was a good person, 79 years and 6 months. Then suddenly at, eight, at six, 79 and 6 months, I changed because Taqdeer came over, changed me like a robot, all the bad things, and now I ended up dying as a Jahannami person. No. Taqdeer does not change us. Qadr, fate, does not force us. There's no cause and effect. There's no force. The biggest misconception we Muslims have about taqdeer is that, oh, everything is written, everything is controlled by Allah, so there's no use, I should not do it. No. Even in this hadith, it's the man or woman, the person, they make the willingly choice. So close to their death, they make that willingly choice to do the wrong things. Allah didn't force them. They didn't just wake up one day and somebody came, hey, start doing haram things now. Start singing, dancing, start eating pork, start drinking, start taking drugs. Nobody came to tell. Their shahawat, remember the word we just took a few moments ago? Their shahawat overpowered them. They lost control. This you, this control, this control of nafs, you can connect with alami arwah. See, in alami arwah, the ruh was innocent. When the ruh came in the fetus, it joined the body. Now when the body was produced, after the birth, now the body and soul are together. From age zero to age puberty, the body and soul is both innocent. Because their intellect, their aql is still developing. When they reach puberty, biologically changed in their body, their organs, certain organs, they don't form in our body until we reach puberty. We have the organ, it's in the body. It's not formed, it's still developing. That's why we say balir, bulugh means biological changes in the body certain organs now are fully functioning so now you are a man or a woman this is very important to understand in the context of the marriage of rasul sallam with aisha Ritran. many people raise a finger and 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 point and criticize on his marriage to aisha but rasul sallam is a teacher he's a he's a he's a rasul he's a messenger he came to teach us the deen so allah through him and this marriage taught us that the youngest age, the minimum age for any woman to marry, not any girl, any woman to marry, is when she reached puberty. That's the minimum age. Maximum age is open. You can marry a woman even at age 100. But very few people will marry a 100-year-old. You want. <laughs> Nobody wants to send a proposal to a 100-year-old. You want to marry me? I think I can marry you. She'll say, go, <laughs> you're, going and, you're going soon, I'm also going soon. So no use of marriage. <laughs> so this is very important to understand that the ruh is one 
and the intellect is within the ruh. So the ruh is there and the intellect there and it's developing, it is forming. And then when it's formed and the body has reached its full puberty, now it is mukallaf. So now the shahawat come. Why are children masoom? Because the, cons- the shahwa is still not made. They may have, like there may be some boys or girls doing something wrong. You may see that. But adat and majority, al-umum, al-average, the shahwa is still developing. By age puberty, now the shahwa is fully formed. Now you see the young boys and girls who are baligh, you see how the interaction and gender interaction makes the fitna and facade. And in this country, you know what happens, like girls becoming pregnant at age, you know, at seventh grade, sixth grade, so young age. Because of that, shahwa. So now what the scholars say in this hadith, that once we know the ruh and we know the irada. See, irada means willingness. Who is the one who made the irada that I will die as a jahannami person? The ruh or the taqdeer, the qadr? The ruh, not the qadr. See, understand this way. Allah knew already from, from beginning. In lohi mahfuz, he knew that this person will live all their life as a jahannami. Six months before their death, they'll become a jannati person. Allah knew this ahead of time. But the knowledge of Allah did not force the person to do this. It was their own irada. See, there are two things. Remember this. One is irada. One is shahwa. Your irada, when it's your irada, when it's overpowers the shahwa, you control your nafs. When the nafs, when the when the shahwa controls the irada, now the nafs controls you. I know a few moments ago somebody said shaitan. I bring that ayah from from that. Allah Subhanahu wa says. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانِ This is in Surah Ibrahim, Surah 14. Let me give you that ayah. Very important ayah. We need to tell this ayah to our kids. If you have young children in the house, because, you know, kids always say when they're young at home, Oh, Mama, Shaitan made me do that. Oh, Baba, Shaitan made me do that. There is nothing as Shaitan making me do that. No, Shaitan doesn't make us do anything. And that is, the proof is in the ayah in Surah Ibrahim. Let me just pull up one second. Ayah number 22, Surah number 14. Surah 14, Ayah number 22, Allah says, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُدِيَ الْأَمْرُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعْدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي فَلَا تَلُومُنِي وَلُومُ أَنفُسَكُمْ مَا أَنَا بِمُسْرِخِكُمْ وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمُسْرِخِي إِنِّي كَفَرْتُ بِمَا أَشْرَكْتُمُونِ مِنْ قَبْلِ إِنَّ الظَّالِمِينَ لَهُمْ أَذَابٌ عَلِيمٌ Translation, listen carefully. And shaitan will say when the matter has been decided. What matter? Qiyamah. Who's going to Jannah? Who's going to Jahannam? When it's decided on Yom Al-Qiyamah, who's Jannati, who's Jahannami? Now Iblis, shaitan is going to come in front of all insan. And then he's going to say, he's going to do khitab. This is called the address of Iblis. On Yom Al-Qiyamah, when there are zillions and zillions of people, it's all decided now. Things are decided, concluded. Now Allah will give the podium or the stage to Iblis Shaitan. Shaitan and Iblis are going to come in front of all these people. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِ الْأَرْمُ That Shaitan will then tell them on that day that in Indeed, Allah promised you a true promise. Huh? And what is that true promise? Jannah. And I also promised you in dunya. Shaitan will say on Yom al Qiyamah to everybody, I also promised you, but I betrayed you. What was the promise of Shaitan? Lazat, pleasures. Shahwat, we have. Shaitan has pleasures, lazat. He shows us a lazat. And our shahwa inside makes the connection with the... See, shahwa and lazza, when they make the connection, the electrical connection is done, you fall. You fall. So he says, I promise you, but I betrayed you. But I had no authority over, over you. وَلَيْسَ The ayah says, وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانِ Sultan means authority. Shaitan is saying, I had no power. I didn't put a gun to your head. I didn't put a knife to your neck. Do this. Do this. No. So Shaitan will then say, 
Fala, tu lu muni. Don't blame me. Don't blame me, please. O lu muan fuz. Blame yourself. You fall. Why? Ma ana be musrikukum. Ah, illa illa an daudukum fas tajabtum li. Shaitan will say, except you know, he will say that except that I invited you and you answered my invitation. Shaitan say, do zina, you did the zina. Shaitan say, drink khamar, you drink the khamar. Shaitan says, do this, take the drugs, morphine or anything, metaphine, amorazah, you did. So Shaitan will say on that day, I only invited you. I said, here, take this, here, do that. You fell. That is why, you know, there's a hadith of Rasulullah where he said that on Yom Al-Qiyamah, there'll be seven people who will be under the shade of Ar-Rahman. Allah's arsh will be brought. Allah's throne will be brought in Qiyamah. Remember, Qiyamah is very hot. Sun is like only, you know, less uh, less than a kilometer. Sun is there. Right now, sun is so far away. Look how hot it is. Some. We can't breathe. Ah, ah, hot, mukayyif, AC. Imagine sun is so close and you have no air condition. And you have no shade, no building, no trees, no big thing that you can take a shade. It's hot, scorching sun. And the angel will say, you, you, you. Go in the shade of Rahman. You, you, you go in the shade of Rahman. Angels will select, hand select people. Seven types of people are qualified to go under the shade. So there's going to be a big shade. And there's going to be a lot of people crammed inside over there. Each one of these people are qualified to be seven types of people. That's a long hadith. We'll do some other day. But one of that seven types of people, Rasulullah said, is one where a Imratun. You know, there's a very beautiful woman that comes in front of a man and says, here, come to me. Shahwa, you know, lazza, pleasure, attraction, desire. And the man says to the woman, inni aqsha Allah, I fear Allah, and turns away. Wow, what control. Any man can fall for a woman. You know very well how dangerous, especially living in the West, in America, we know how dangerous the society is. That... Women can seduce, with all due respect to women, I'm not saying that all women are back, but they are very seducive, seductive women. And the hadith says very clearly that seven people will be under the shade. One of those seven is a man who sees a very seductive woman and she invites him. Like in the Chisra of Yusuf, remember, the wife of the Aziz, it was the woman in the palace. She closed the doors and she told Yusuf, come. And Yusuf did not want anything. He wanted to run away. But it was the woman who did that. And this hadith says the same thing that the woman initiates. The woman says to the man, come. But the man says, I fear Allah. Just imagine how much the aql is formulated. Just imagine how powerful the ruh is. Just imagine how much strong the irada is. See, when you make an irada for something, nobody can defeat you. Likewise, if a person, if a man or woman makes irada for, to do a sin and ism, the whole world cannot stop them because irada is the thing of the ruh. And when you have made the irada for something, it's very hard to convince them back. That's what they call that they are rigid. You know, ziddi, zid. What is it? It's the irada, firm, determined. Oh, I got to do this. You know how sometimes kids come up, mom and baba, I got to marry this girl. That's it. Whether you do anything or nothing, I'm just going to marry. I'd rather die than not marry her. This statement is showing the the strength of the irada that come what may you cannot convince me mama bab dad mom no way so irada that allah has given every ruh every insan has an irada and when your irada is connected with taqwa with fear of allah it becomes faulad like iron now shaitan iblis or any shahwad any lazza come in front of them no like the hadith, Rasul is saying, the woman is standing in front and the woman is saying, come. But the man turns away saying, I fear Allah, inni akshu Allah. That's why this person will be given the qualification, come to the shade of Rahman. You saved yourself from zina. You had the ability to do zina. You had the opportunity to do zina. And you had a woman that was ready to do that with you. Yet you fear Allah and you knew Allah's maqam. So you restrain yourself. This self-restraint comes from irada. And where does irada come from? Taqwa. Like one brother said here, someone said right now, connection with Allah. When our connection with Allah is strong, then the irada is strong to do good. 
when our connection is weak with Allah, then our irada is also strong to do what? Irada is huh? to, to do wrong things, haram things. So irada is strong in both condition. Yeah. Very good question. Yes. Good. Good. You stopped me right in the middle and asked the same. Yes. Question. The sisters asked the question that the hadith mentions that a woman comes in front of a man and does that. And so what about the opposite? Vice versa. If a man comes in front of a woman and tries to seduce her and say, here I am. And she runs away. She protects her chastity, modesty, her, uh, her purity. She will also be in the shade of Rahman. Remember, the hadith of Rasulullah are not gender oriented. They are unigender, meaning... He says it in one context, but it means both the gender. Meaning man will also be under the shade of Rahman. Woman will also be who protected herself. Who protected herself from that. So what we are trying to explain is the connection between irada and shahwa. The whole battle. This is the whole battle of insan, the ruh, the nafs. Irada and shahwa. Muttaqi people are those who control their shahwa and have strong irada. And uh, bad people, let's say, sinning people are those who have weak irada and their shahwa control over them. Like the ayah in the Quran, Allah says that, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَىٰ وَنَفْسِهُ وَمَا سَوَىٰ And I swear by the soul and how I fashioned it, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَىٰ I have embedded in them fujur, evilness, sinfulness, وَتَقْوَىٰ and righteousness. Indeed, successful is the one who purifies their soul. That is why in order to make good irada, strong irada, we need to purify the soul. Why do we need to purify the soul? Because the shahwat, the lazad that come our way, entering through the eyes, through the ears, through the brain, that is entering in it, it's, it's, um, it's uh, dirtying, filtering the soul, the ruh. That's why you need to nafs, purification of the soul. The more you purify the soul, the more irada you have to do good. The more you purify your soul, the more strong conviction irada you have to restrain yourself from anything haram. You want to, I want to show you an example of how quwa irada is. There are some people who are so pious, so muttaqi, that if somebody sit in front of them doing ghiba of someone else, a third part, like you know ghiba what it is, backbiting. If somebody is backbiting about someone, in front of you, and you have so strong irada, they say, stop, please, don't talk back body in front of me, or I will get up and leave. And if they still don't stop, they're still doing ghibah of that person, that person gets up and leave. This is irad. Why? Because they don't want to pollute their ears. Because listening to backbiting is also a sin. Doing backbiting is it, but you're listening to it. Ah, tell me more. Yeah, yeah, tell me more about him. Tell me more about her. Yeah, what information you have? This is now, this is the shahwat coming out. See, everyone has a shahwat. Shahwat doesn't just mean between gender, male, female. Shahwat also means towards sin. Somebody backbiting, now the shahwat comes out. Yeah, let me find out more about this person. And this is haram, this is wrong. Allah said in Quran, Surah, in Surah Hujurat, Ya yuladzina amanu ishtanibu uh, and don't let one of you backbite another why? because when you backbite somebody it's like you're chewing up their flesh you're eating them raw meat from their body and the reason Allah gave in the ayah this example to make us feel detested abhorring how can you eat your brother's dead meat or your sister's dead meat for that sake in terms of gender oriented can you eat your own blood sister's dead meat, your own blood brother's dead meat? No. Allah says, Karahtumu. Wala yakta badumu bada. Ayu hebu ahadugum ain yakura lahma akihi maiden. Fa karehtumu. Meaning you will hate, dislike eating the dead meat of your brother or sister the same way you should hate and dislike riba. But you know what? The Muslim ummah is plagued with this disease. Everywhere you go, the whole Muslim world. Everyone, this is one of the easiest slip that we fall into. Even big, big people, people who are very, very muttaqi, even they slip and fall when they're hearing somebody doing backbiting. They just, they don't do anything. They, they don't stop them or they don't get up and leave. And, you know, excuse people say, oh, I wasn't doing the backbiting. He was doing it. She was doing it. Well, you were listening. I was just listening. I was just in the room. 
But why are you in the room? Well, I was just, just sitting there. I didn't do anything. Just don't blame me. No, you are to blame. That's what Allah is saying. You are partially to blame because you allowed that person to continue backbiting about a person. Because if that person had the guts, they would say it in front of the person. What is why is backbiting haram? Why Allah make back? Because you are defaming, slandering somebody, you're talking bad about someone behind their back without them having the chance to defend themselves. Because if they were in front, they would say, You're lying, you're lying, that's a lie. So then the third party will know, okay, this is a lie. But when you backbite, the third party thinks, oh, this is the truth. This is the truth. That means he's talking about. So that's why we have to understand the danger of shahawat and we have to understand the quwa of irada. The other thing that is very important in this hadith is about the nafs. You know, there are three stages of the nafs. I said this last Wednesday. I'm going to finish off with this today. There are three stages or three marahil of the nafs, which the Quran tells us. And remember, we said that nafs and ruh is the same thing. It's the same, the ruh, the nafs. So Allah says in the Quran, there is... The, the the worst, how should I put it? Uh, not the worst, but the lowest level of the nafs is the nafs that is mentioned in Surah uh, Yusuf, Surah 12, where Allah says at the beginning of the 13th juz, 13th part, that Allah says, What nafsul ammara, inna nafsal la ammara bisu, that the nafs is laden, proven to do bad. Meaning, this is the lowest level of the nafs. That it is saying, yes, I am bad. And I am like this. This is like the stubbornness of the nafs. This is like the lowest ebb of the nafs. Meaning the taqwa is very, very low for this kind of nafs. When you do tazkiyat to nafs, when you do purification of soul, now the nafs raises up the bar and becomes nafsul lawama. Nafsul lawama comes from loam. Lam, wow, mean. Loam means blame. The self-reproaching soul, the self-blaming soul, the self, the, the nafs that says, yes, I am very bad. I need to change. Yes, please make dua for me. I'm trying my best. So now this is a little bit better than the previous. The previous stage was like hadaram, you know, like, uh, how should I say, stubborn, rigid. Yeah, I'm bad. So what? Mind your own business. None of your business. So that's like nafsul ammara bisu. Yeah, I'm a bad soul. Take it or leave it. So that's the lowest level. Now the person work on the nafs, raise the bar a little bit, they become nafsul lawam. Now they're blaming themselves. Yes, brother, you're right. I made a mistake. Yes, I made a sin. Yes, I have weakness. Yes, I have to do something better. Yes, I have to change myself. So this is nafsul lawam, blaming, self-blaming themselves and acknowledging that there is a weakness in me. I need to become better. So now they work harder and harder. Now they become what? The famous nafs, which is mentioned in Surah Fajr. Yeah, it's an Urdu word too. Itminan means sukun, peace. Now, this itminan mutmainna teaches us that the nafs is in base sukun. When nafs is ammaratan bisu, when nafs is lawama, it is in base sukun. It's not in sukun, it's not in tamin. It's restless, disturbed, perturbed, anxious, panic. There is no sukun in life. See, what do we want? When you look at the body, the body is the body there, but the ruh is there. The emotions that we feel is not the body. The emotions we feel is the ruh. And what does the, what does the ruh want, bottom line, in this dunya? Sukun. sukun e qalb Itminan. If there's no sukun, you're always, always restless, always disturbed. That's why Allah said that there are three stages. And you have to die... At the stage, highest level, stage number three, mutma'in. That's why Allah says in the ayah, Ya ayyatu nafsul mutma'in, irji'i, return, come back, irji'i ila rabbiki, come back to your Lord, how? Radiyatam mardiyya, come back to your Lord, please with Allah, and Allah please with you. In other words, the struggle is this much. This is what life, This the whole life is this struggle. From nafsul ammara to bisu to nafsul lawama to nafsul mutmainna. If we reach nafsul mutmainna in the time that Allah has given us on this earth, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, we won the game. We are winners. And you know what the sign of nafsul mutmainna is? One of the signs that the ulama say of nafsul mutmainna is that there'll be a smile when, when the ru is qabs, when the ru is taken, there's a smile on their face. 
Sign number two, which you will see, is that they're able, to, their finger automatically has like this, the shahad. Because they were reciting the shahada when the Malik al maut was taking the ruh out of the body, they were reciting the shahada. So, you know, when the ruh leaves the body, the body becomes akardiyadi, the body becomes stiff. So they died like this. If you see any dead body with the finger, like many times when we do ghusl of janazah, when the body comes, we've seen many times that the body is like this. And the first thing I say to the people giving ghusl, I said, look, this is nafs al-mutma'in. They died like this. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna wa Allah. And the third sign that the ulama said, that they are able to complete the kalima before the ruh is qabs. These three major signs, smiling face, index finger like this, because they were they knew they're dying, so they just pointed to Allah. Ya Allah, Ashhadu an la ilaha And Allah took it. May Allah give us this note to all of us. May Allah give us nafsul mutma'inna. May Allah give us the death where we say kalima shahada as the last word from our tongues. Ameen, Ya Rabb. And now in conclusion, so these are the three. We talked about life is a test. Last Wednesday we mentioned that. That, that is also from this hadith. And then the last thing is tawfiq. Allah says in the Quran, uh, in surah... I forget the surah name. Uh, surah Hud, I think. Yeah, Surah Hud. Allah says, وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ This is Shoaib telling the people that my tawfiq is only from Allah. What does tawfiq mean? It comes from the root word of wafaqa. 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 Huh? It means agreement. Tawfiq means that you are doing something in agreement with Allah's irad. See, there is one irada of the soul. Nafs. My irada. Our irada. And there's one irada of Allah. So when the nafs irada and Allah irada join together, this is tawfiq. Now you understand what I said? After Asr, I met a brother and he asked me, well, we have the dars today after Maghrib? I said, yeah. I said, you come in, Shais. And he made some uzr, some excuse. And I said at the time, if Allah give him tawfiq, he will show up in Maghrib. And he's sitting here. This is the meaning of irada, tawfiq. You made the intention, Allah loved the intention because you were sitting in the masjid, you were right after Asr, you made Salatul Jama'ah. So sometimes there is waqt of qubul, qubuliyat, qubuliyat ka waqt. At that moment, we should make dua. Because you never know, it's the time of qubuliyat, Allah will accept. So remember when you were saying, I said, say inshallah, you said inshallah. That inshallah, Allah accept. And he give you tawfiq and you're sitting here from now. So this is a very important concept to understand, tawfiq. We should always ask Allah for tawfiq. This hadith is talking about that when the angel came and breathed the ruh in the fetus, now the fetus is governed by the ruh. So the only way the ruh can be strong in irada is always ask Allah, Allah give me tawfiq. Allah give me tawfiq for Ramadan. Allah give me tawfiq for Salatul Jama'ah in Masjid. Allah give me tawfiq for this. Allah give me tawfiq. Without the tawfiq from Allah, the nafs cannot do anything. They are very good examples about the inshallah. Because most people yeah. say inshallah and I see that. Yeah. And the dua you can make, the dua you can make to get tawfiq from Allah is this. Hmm? Allahumma, say after me, repeat after me so you can learn. Allahumma, wafiqni lima anta tuhibbu wa tarda. Simple dua. Allahumma, wafiqni lima anta let me give you a translation. You're saying, Ya Allah, oh my beloved Allah, Allahumma, wafiqni. Give me tawfiq, give me intuition, give me the encouragement, give me the strength, give me the irada, wafiqni. Lima, for that. Lima, for that thing. Anta, you, to hibbu, love. Whatever Allah loves. Allah loves Jannah. Allah loves that you pray in Jama'in Masjid. Allah loves that you do hasana. Allah loves that you stay away from so whatever Allah loves, you're asking that. Allah mawfiqni lima anta tuhibbu wa and tarda, which will which you are pleased with. Allah will not be pleased with singing, dancing, drugs, drinking, womanizing, and all this. So Allah will save us from that. This is the best dua we can make for the ruh soul. Allahumma recite this every day, anytime, morning, afternoon, evening. Keep repeating this dua. Every namaz, every salah, make this dua. Allahumma wa fiqni lima anta tuhibbu wa tarda. Allahumma wa fiqni lima anta tuhibbu wa tarda. It's a very open-ended dua. 
everything is included in, in this dua because you are saying to Allah, Oh Allah, give me the tawfiq to do that which you love and you are pleased with. So if Allah accepts this dua, He will control, so to speak, He will give us the irada to control our nafs. Allah doesn't control our nafs. We control our nafs. But He will give us the irada, the quwa, to control the nafs and stay away from bad and come to good. You know, many people think that, oh, I came to the masjid to pray. It is my uh, achievement, my accomplishment. No. It's only from Allah. Allah gave me tawfiq, so I came to the masjid. If Allah doesn't give me tawfiq, there are many people who are daily coming to the salah, suddenly they stop coming to masjid praying. Because now, tawfiq is not there from Allah. Never ever, please, please, never ever think that if you're coming to the masjid, it's because of your own nafs or your own soul or ruh or your own irada. It is from the tawfiq from Allah. And that's what Allah says in the Quran. وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ And my tawfiq is only from Allah. My, my, my encouragement is only from Allah. If Allah gives me the tawfiq, I'll do that. If Allah gives me the tawfiq, I'll fast from Allah. If Allah gives me the tawfiq, I'll pray five times a day. If Allah gives me the tawfiq, I'll come to the masjid five times salat. If Allah gives me tawfiq, I'll do a lot of sadaqat. Tawfiq, tawfiq, tawfiq. And that is very important. With that, we come to the end of this hadith. It was a very long hadith. That's why it took us two Wednesdays. Inshallah, next Wednesday, we'll continue with next hadith, hadith number five, which is about innovation and bid'ah. And we'll cover that, inshallah, next Wednesday after Maghrib. It's time for Isha Azan. So let us make dua, Isha. Allahumma anta salamika salam tabaraka rabbana wa ta'ayti aziz wa ikram. Allahumma taqabbal minna inna kata sami'u alim wa tuba ilayna maulana inna kata tuba rahim. Allahumma wafiqna lima anta tuhibu wa tarda. Allahumma wafiqna lima anta tuhibu wa tarda ibn al-bin. اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكره إلينا الكفر والفسوق والإسيان يا رب العالمين اللهم اغفر المسلمين والمسلمات المؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منه والأموات إنك أنت سميع مجيب دعوات وصلى الله عليه خلق محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه رحمة الله إن سمعك الله بيندك نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفر ونتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته